So I'd like to warn you here that um, some of these topics can be painful and triggering. And you may experience, as I did, kind of this emotional roller coaster as we walk through this. So I'm going to ask for your indulgence to, and some grace as I recount these stories and topics that, quite frankly, don't always paint me in the best light. And uh, as Denise knows, I sometimes get a bit choked up while giving this presentation, but I, I think that you know the honesty around that is actually a good thing. Um, the reason I'm doing this is it's important to me that others learn from the mistakes I've made kind of on my journey to hopefully becoming a male ally. And hopefully you're encouraged by, by where I've gotten on this journey. So I usually hate these who am I slides and, and honestly, I've, I've generally stopped doing them in my talks. However, I'm gonna make an exception here because I believe it's really important for all of you to understand a little bit more about me and why I was motivated to build this talk. So I identify as a partner, a father, a grandfather now, an engineer and technologist, and a community member in tech and open source. And so for those that kind of heard Denise's initial commentary about we'll always have Paris, the at last uh, picture there is a picture of Denise and Jim Zemlin and myself at this event in Paris. And, and uh, it's I really do uh, resonate with, with that community. Um, but you'll notice I listed my personal things first, and, and I don't think that's an accident. My partner, Nicole, is both my best friend and my biggest source of inspiration for this talk. I think I've learned more from her about the challenges of diversity and inclusion firsthand than in all of the reading and studying I've done on the topic. And my kids, Matthew, Rachel, and Duncan, my granddaughter, Sophia, they're a huge reason why I built this talk. I want Rachel and Sophia to grow up in a world, whether they're in tech or not, where they don't have to struggle as much as Nicole and others have. And I want my sons to be the kind of men that do their very best to support and champion all women and underrepresented groups. So with that, I'd like to tell you a story in this, in this next slide, uh, which is a video clip. I'm incredibly lucky to know some amazing people in open source and tech communities, including my friend Jennifer Clower, uh, who was formerly of the Linux Foundation, and she's now running her own PR firm. One of her passions is helping tell stories of women in tech, including the challenges and amazing things they've accomplished. And I was very humbled and honestly taken aback when Jennifer asked me to be part of a documentary series she's building called The Chasing Grace Project, and maybe some of you have heard of it. This is a six episode series dedicated to shedding light on women in technology who've long been underrepresented. And the clip uh, is used with Jennifer and her co-producer Gary's permission. I'd like to play it for you now, as I think it really forms the core story of, uh, of my talk. So I was attending a technology conference and there was a women in tech track session and I decided I wanted to attend that to try to be a supportive ally and even at that time didn't know that I was an ally so I kind of wanted to go to see what this was all about. So I walk into this meeting and I'm one of a half a dozen males in a room full of women and I kind of look around and not sure what to do and I go and I sit kind of at the end of one of the tables and I didn't say anything for most of the meeting and then I was asked a question about community management and what I thought uh, we could do in the community management space to improve diversity and inclusion in, in women in tech and I gave an answer and then I was called out. I was called out by someone who said well the problem is that we have way too many white male uh, community managers in tech and you're actually part of the problem. I just had a very visceral reaction. I responded in my head with, well, wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense. How can this person who doesn't even know me be calling me out for something that I didn't even realize I had? And it, I was very angry. I felt betrayed. I kind of said, well, wait a minute, I, I came to this meeting. I could have been anywhere else in this conference. I chose to come to this meeting because I believe in increasing diversity and inclusion. And to be attacked like that was a very, very challenging thing for me. I just kept getting angrier and angrier and angrier, and I just had to leave the meeting. Um, and thankfully, you know, I left the meeting and then basically went on this journey of discovery. So I think um, that was the most powerful thing I saw come out of that was that I could really begin to understand, again, the motivations of what caused that person to call me out in the meeting. And so as you saw from that clip, uh, I was a bit blindsided. Um, and I have to tell you, I was angry, frustrated, resentful, probably saw it in that clip, and a little bit embarrassed. Um, I wanted nothing more to, to, than to just storm out of that room or tell that person off. And thankfully, Nicole was sitting there and Denise was actually in this meeting. Uh, and Nicole had me gently sit down and I kind of seethed through the rest of that meeting. And you know, I'll be pretty honest, I seethed really through this next six months every time I thought about this incident. Um, and then, oops, 
want to slide too many. And then it kind of, uh, my journey began. And through Nicole and Denise and other people's patient tutoring, I began to think more critically about what happened. And, and I think the biggest issue with what had happened for me was twofold. Number one, as you heard from the clip, I kind of struggled through college, worked a couple of jobs, minimal help from my parents. And I felt like I really worked hard for what I'd achieved. And I couldn't understand how unconscious bias and white male privilege applied to me. I mean, I was like, hey, I, I've worked hard. This doesn't make any sense. I also could never truly understand what it's like to be someone in an underrepresented group. And I think these two facts led to the biggest misunderstandings of, of my reaction to this whole incident. So I spent months and probably longer than that, uh, extremely angry about all of this. And I couldn't figure out why I was being singled out. Uh, I really felt like I was being put on trial by that person in the meeting and others who kind of piggybacked on what she had to say. And I took it very personally. Um, I associated all the pain and the anguish that people from the underrepresented groups were just venting. They were just really venting and I, I viewed it as a personal attack on me. Um, in short, you know, I don't, I don't think I could really see how um, they relate to how they saw the world. Uh, and I always thought I was a very fair person, but my frustration and anger were showing up in the way that I brought unconscious bias to things like being upset when I wasn't chosen to speak or write about open source and community and you know, when I had friends from underrepresented groups who got talks instead of me. Uh, so yeah, I, I have to admit it, I went through that whole reverse discrimination argument in my head. Um, it wasn't a good time and it made me focus on the wrong thing, which was me. I had to get past worrying about what the effect was on me and think about how I could move past this. So my aha moment in all of this is when I finally was able to realize that my white male privilege and unconscious bias in no way diminished any of the struggles that I'd, that I'd had in college or where I'd, where I'd come through in my career. Being white and male was clearly not my choice, but you know, through reading and thinking about this, and most importantly, working with trusted friends and colleagues from these underrepresented groups, I began to slowly understand that I had these advantages that I hadn't earned, and quite frankly, I was blind to them. So making the distinction between my struggles and hard work and the inherent advantages I have as a white male in tech wasn't easy. It was probably one of the most difficult things I've ever had to do. Um, and it's, I think it's one of the hardest things sometimes that men in tech, even well-intentioned ones, struggle with. So thankfully, uh, Jennifer Clower and her team did capture how I finally came to a better point in this experience. And, and I'd like to share that with you now. So the journey I embarked upon when I was called out in this meeting uh, for having white male privilege was to try to ask questions of female counterparts that I trusted and actually men that I knew were already good male allies. I wanted to learn from their experience and get an understanding of what white male privilege was because I think what I reacted to in that meeting was I can't possibly have white male privilege because I struggled to put myself through college by having two jobs. I struggled academically, I struggled personally. and. Finally being able to understand by asking questions of those that I trusted that there wasn't, a, there wasn't anything that diminished my struggle. Having white male privilege did not diminish my struggle. It just made me realize that I actually had a responsibility if I truly believed in, in diversity and inclusion in tech. I had a responsibility to understand what white male privilege was and to understand how I could use the inherent advantage I have by being a white male in tech to further diversity and inclusion. Being a part of the, the women in tech movement is huge. It actually gives me a sense of purpose. And when you get that sense of community from women in tech who, are, who are, have had challenges and who have understood that you've also had challenges, but in a different way, that support is tremendous. So, I think I was surprised. I was as surprised as anyone when some of my colleagues, including Mithya and Denise, started mentioning me in their talks or to others as being a male ally. Uh, I don't think I really still think of myself in these terms. Um, you know, it's not as like I get up every morning, I slap my male ally name tag on, and I go out to face the day. Uh, I think if you're trying to if you're trying to do it for that reason, you're going about it for the wrong reasons, uh, and you're definitely going to need a lot of help. So, you know, that being said, I recognize that this. Through this process that as a white male in tech, I have both a tremendous opportunity and a responsibility to change the prevailing situation that's been going on for so long. This situation isn't going to be fixed solely by legislation or by training programs or awareness campaigns or by lobbying. 
those are all important components, but honestly, nothing changes without, without people in the majority position like myself and other white males in tech stepping up and working to try to see a better tomorrow, using the privilege we have to foster the change we wanna see. So one of the things that I think helped pull me through a lot of these challenges is that I, early on, I was raised with a strong sense of duty and service to others. Uh, for me, it manifested itself in things like being a CAL FIRE volunteer for, for over 10 years. So with that as a framework, I'd like to share some ways I found, um, and I'd love to hear more in the discussion later um, about how to use privilege and service of others. So number one, calling out bad behavior. Uh, and this is tough because when you call out bad behavior, you don't wanna encourage trolling by behavior by giving them the limelight. And one of the things I've learned through um, doing this is that I sometimes would get too engaged in calling out bad behavior and then get engaged with a troll and then that actually d diminished, you know, calling it out. It kind of made it about me again. Um, be someone who's willing to listen and, and not judge, but, or, or try to fix a situation because sometimes um, people from underrepresented groups really just someone want someone to honestly listen to them. Um, and then finally, using your inherent privilege to lift up others, things like get, helping get women and others to speak at conferences, advocating for them in leadership roles and helping partner with them to get their ideas heard and acted upon. And so I want to leave you with some final thoughts here as I close. Um, some of the important lessons I've kind of learned in my journey uh, along the way. And, and number one, the number one, and it's a huge one, is it's not about me. Really recognizing that was the, was the beginning of, of my actually getting to a good place. And it was a hard one to swallow, uh, both me personally from being an only child, also to being someone who's been in a dominant position in tech because of factors that I can't control. When I finally absorbed this, it really made all the difference. White males like me don't lose by paying things forward. Lending a hand and advocating for others is not a zero sum game. And finally, being vulnerable doesn't make you weak. It makes you a better employee, a better partner, a better parent, and quite honestly, just a better human. My hope is that you'll all join me uh, in helping advance the cause of diversity and inclusion so that one day we don't have to give talks like this one. Thank you, everybody. That was great, thank you. Now, if you would stick around until um, Susan is done so that we can do the Q&A together, we do have one question already. Susan, if I could get you to um, decloak again, and um, Guy, you're gonna cloak up for a minute while we get Susan's perspective, and then we will re-meet for uh, a wrap up in the questions, okay? All right. Well, hi everyone. I'm Susan Wands. Um, I get to follow that, so yay. Uh, <laughs> so um, a little bit about me. I am the founder of a women in tech group here in Raleigh-Durham called Women in Tech Allies. Um, we are a group of people, all genders, backgrounds, um, all different parts of the software development lifecycle, all different skill sets, ages, who come together to um, create programming around making um, tech a more diverse and inclusive space. So um, I guess that's why I'm talking about this today. Um, during the day, I am a full stock, full stock developer. Um, I work with a couple of different startups um, and I really just enjoy coding and being a developer. Um, but I did not take a traditional path into technology. I um, actually did not go through a computer science program. Um, I was a behavioral neuroscience major, and then I went off and I did a whole bunch of other stuff, and I was in um, construction project management for 12 years, so that really, you know, that screams uh, excellent software developer, right? Um, but I hit a glass ceiling, and I decided to pivot, and I basically turned my life upside down, moved my family and my four-year-old to Texas, went through a boot camp to learn how to code, lived in a hotel for 90 days, uh, racked up a huge amount of debt doing it, um, but made it into uh, a new career. And so a lot of people are like, that's crazy. Why would you do something like that? Uh, <laughs> but now I'm a software developer. Um, what's, what's interesting to me is, and I made that journey probably about eight years ago now, uh, but at the time there were a lot, there's and, and still there's a lot of news, a lot of um, you know, companies talking about how they need tech, tech talent, how, you know, they really need more people to get interested in technology. 
But it's interesting because I, I was a boot camp graduate. I've talked to a lot of boot camp graduates and people who have tried to self teach themselves or go through, you know, programs to try to, to convert into uh, someone who's, you know, skilled enough to get a job in tech. And it's not that easy. Um, companies and the tech industry as a whole is, is not as welcoming and not as open to people from non-traditional paths into tech as you would think they would be based upon how much demand they say they have. Um, and so it, it's interesting because people will be like, well, that's, you know, that's a very non-traditional path into tech, but really it's not. It's the first path that there was into being a developer. Okay, so a little bit more about my history and how this applies is that my parents actually met in a coding boot camp. Oh, in 1980, I want to say they probably my, my parents met, that was my stepdad and my mom. So they met probably around 1981, 1982 in a boot camp. At the time, software development was a brand new thing. There was no such thing as computer science really uh, for you know, producing programmers at that point. Um, and the way that people became programmers was that companies, major companies, insurance companies, banks, airlines, um, you know, your major companies that were just starting to adopt computers as this new technology that was gonna like revolutionize their industry, they all needed programmers and there weren't programmers, they didn't exist, okay? So what did industry do? Well, most of those companies created boot camps. They created training programs. They hired people who had aptitude. They tested them for things like uh, logic tests and, you know, other kinds of aptitude tests to see if this kind of, if they had the type of thinking and thought process and interest and ability to learn that they could grow into and be developed into a programmer. So both of my parents, they didn't have computer science degrees either because nobody had computer science degrees who were developers 40 years ago. Um, they had, my mom was pre-med, pre-law. She was a black woman in tech in the early 80s. Okay, so talk about trailblazer, right? My dad was a history major and a Navy veteran. Okay, so again, another, uh, if you want to talk about being a diverse group, that's how you got a diverse group. And at the time, women were like almost 40% of programmers. Now we're down to about 20. So apparently that system worked really well for getting people in. Um, and that was at a time too, if you think about it, in late seventies, early eighties, we were still ramping up women's involvement in the workplace at all, uh, let alone having 40% representation in a particular field and a high tech field. So, the benefit of that type of system and when companies had that kind of system and they, they, they brought people in, they paid them, okay, to learn and taught them exactly the tech stack that they needed, which at the time tech stacks were kind of interesting. I mean, they had punch cards in that class. So tech stack was kind of like a stack of cards, I guess. Uh, <laughs> but assembly language, you know, the, the very beginnings of programming, they taught these people, you know, how to do it. And what was great is there was such loyalty among the people who were taught and trained that way. They stayed with their companies for 10, 15 years because they felt like the company invested in them and they invested back in their company. So if you're if we're working at a company or you're doing HR and you have people bouncing every two years, maybe investment in them is the way to stop doing that. Um, but what happened? Everyone, you know, everyone wonders what, well, what happened? If we started that way, how did we end up where we are now? And the, the way we did that is that companies decided it was better for their bottom line to shift that responsibility of learning to the employees, okay? And so when, when they ended a lot of these boot camp programs and they shifted their focus to encouraging colleges and universities to train people in software development and therefore computer science programs were developed and academia decided that the best place to put this was in engineering, okay? Now, nothing against engineering as a field, but uh, they have a different thought process in how they learn, 
Okay. And, um, you know, I, as I don't know if anyone who has been through computer science, if you've ever heard of a weed out class, okay? I'm gonna read you a little quote about a weed out class, uh, class someone who was, went through engineering. At my flagship university about 30 years ago, the engineering weed out rate was well over 50%. Given the talent of some that still graduated, I think they may, may have still set the bar a bit too low, okay? so. The idea of an engineering class um, actually wanting to weed people out, that thought process um, has kind of continued on and been adopted into our corporate culture now when it comes to computers and computer science and your IT departments. And, you know, this weed out type of mentality shows up in a lot of different ways. It shows up in job descriptions. It shows up in the hiring process for technology. Um, it shows up in code challenges. It shows up in, in how tech tends to conduct itself, especially when it comes to developers and things like that. So, you know, and, and the assumption is that people drop out or are weeded out because they're not intelligent enough to handle it or anything like that. And really, it's more than that. Um, it, it's not that at all. I mean, a lot of the people who leave, they don't go and like decide to take up underwater basket weaving, okay? They leave and they go into pre-med. They go into other sciences. Um, so these people are intelligent, but they're coming from a place where this kind of mentality of not being inclusive, even in schools, um, kind of affects them in a more, uh, more profound way. So like, for example, if you're the, one of the few women in an engineering program and you hit one of these uh, weed out classes, most of these groups, they start to form student groups and they study with each other and they help each other. When you're the only woman in the class and you go and ask a guy, hey, do you wanna to study together? that's not the same conversation, okay? That, there's some societal uh, issues that pop up where maybe your invitation is taken to be a little bit more than what you wanted it to be. Um, if you are showing up to college and you're the first one in your family to go to college and you're on a, a scholarship and you know your GPA drops below a certain point and you're out, you're not gonna take that chance on too many weed out classes bumping you completely out of the opportunity to graduate from college. You're gonna switch into a major that is welcoming to you, that is interested in having you there, okay? So it's not just they weren't smart enough to handle it. And that's kind of the attitude that sometimes gets carried over, okay? So, you know, are there certain coding jobs that require a computer science degree? Well, yeah, I guess if you're launching someone into space or you're, you know, programming a weapons program, yay, yeah, yeah, okay, you might need that. But if you're doing the, the amount of the explosion in what we have in terms of technology, e-commerce, online learning, uh, you know, CMS and systems, I mean, there, there's so many, I mean, there, it's, there's no bounds. Everything, especially now that we, we see with COVID, everything is online. Everything is in technology now. We need so many more people to come into this industry. And we need that growth to be diverse, to have different schools of thought, to be an opportunity for all different people and not just one group of people to be able to benefit from the explosion that we have. That in order to do that, we have to lose this idea of trying to weed people out. OK, um, the idea of instead what we started with, which was looking for potential, OK, seeking potential in people. Um, how how do we, we switch this? OK, so, for example, I talked about hiring practices. So let's look at job descriptions. Um, if you work at a company and you look at your careers page and all of your job descriptions that have to do with development list right off the bat computer science degree or other uh, required, you've just eliminated everyone who comes from a, a non-traditional role, okay? When you sit there and put um, how many years of a particular um, skill they need, 
you've started to eliminate and weed out people. What if you have somebody who is just a savant and they have taught themselves, you know, DevOps and they are amazing and they've been doing it extensively for three years, just really digging in. You just ruled them out because you said you want seven or seven to 10 years. That's it. Okay. Um, so if you shift job descriptions to actually list what are the actual skills that are must have for this position day one, the day they walk in the door? And then what is the rest of the stack that you're hoping they'll want to learn over once they're in, okay? That kind of job description leaves things more open for different people who have skill sets that could be a perfect fit for what you're looking for, okay? Um, code challenges. Okay, uh, the number of code challenges that I have done that have absolutely nothing, not even close to relating to the role that I'm actually applying for was insane, it's particularly coming out of a boot camp. It's like they see that you came out of a boot camp and you didn't go through a computer science program. And it's like they go into their closet, find their computer science book, dust it off, turn to, the, to a page somewhere and pull a question out just to stump you just to let you know that you don't know what I know. And it's like, no, I don't know what you know, but I have 12 years of experience in the real world. And I went through a boot camp and changed, flipped my life over for this opportunity. And you're ruling me out based upon a question on page 67 of your computer science book that you haven't even looked at since you were in college. Okay. So, you know, having being cautious of who you allow to do code challenges. What kind of code challenges are they doing? Do they actually relate to the, to the job that's being applied for? Um, you know, not doing whiteboard stuff because ew, you know, give them something to do, let them go do it and let them bring it back. You know, no one needs to be sitting there on a hot seat. That's not, that's, that's rude, you know? Um, there's lots of different ways that this can apply. It also applies to your internal environment when you do hire people. So, you know, if you're a senior right now, who are you mentoring? Who are you growing and developing? A lot of the times senior at this point is just the pay scale that you're on, or maybe the years that you've been in and the things that you've seen. But if you're senior, I challenge you to make sure that your senior title also means that you're developing people, that you're mentoring people, that you know your code reviews or your um, you know yearly reviews of people actually are designed to help grow them um, and help them get better. Um, and as as companies, if there you really do notice the companies that that take the time to hire junior people, hire mid-level people, uh, rather than trying to find uh, the perfect fit for the guy who's leaving, who grew into that role over 10 years. <laughs> you expect someone to come in right off the bat and know everything that he knew, just, you know. Um, the people who, the, the companies that actually commit to growing and developing and training people into a role have so much more longevity in their staff. They have so many, so much more loyalty for the people who work there. And they also have a tendency to have much more diverse and much more inclusive environments. So um, if we can replace that weed out culture with a desire to find potential in people and develop it, it's better for our whole industry, it's better for companies and it's definitely better for diversity and inclusion. So that's what I've got. <laughs> Thank you. Lots to think of there. So now, Guy, if I could get you to rejoin. There you are. Life is good. OK. Um, so looking for, looking for uh, a lot of support for what you had to say in the comments. I'm going to start with the question that was queued up for us originally um, by Ricky, which wasn't addressed in the last session. So I'll read you this because it's a bit long. One question that didn't get answered in Clarence and Corn's session would be a good discussion in the wrap up. When you're the only in the room, 
quote unquote, only in the room. How do you handle microaggressions in the moment? I feel supported by my management, can take it up with superiors afterwards. Do you have any tips for the in the moment, how to identify, respond to those kinds of microaggressions and, and how to not second guess yourself or freeze? And what's the role of the ally in that? Janine? Yeah, you can go first. Oh, okay, um, microaggressions. Well, I, I think that a lot of the time, I, I like context a little bit. Um, you know, I find that it depends on a little bit more on the context. If I am in a situation where I feel like there's a microaggression going on and it's directed at me, um, I look at, do I think based upon my background of this person that perhaps it's unintentional? Or do I think that um, it's maybe more than that, okay? If I think it's more than that, I will actually say something at the time, but that's kind of me. <laughs> you know, not everybody's that brave, right? Um, if I think that it's directed towards some other person, I will find a way to support them in that moment. So um, I, it's easier with an example, like somebody, um, one that I, I often talk about is repeating what somebody else said and giving them attribution, for example, like somebody is in a meeting and they, they take off on somebody's point and like they almost own what somebody else's idea and, and saying, you know what, that's a great point. When Mary said it and she talked about blah, 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 that was really great. Mary, can you expand upon that a little bit? Like redirecting, being aware of what's okay. going on. If I feel that it's something directed towards me and I don't think it's really purposeful, I usually try to just kind of make a note and I'll go and talk to that person outside. I don't necessarily feel like calling people on the carpet at the moment if it's not intentional is the best policy, but sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do. <laughs> but Guy, what do you think? Uh, no, I'm just nodding because that's exactly what I would have answered. Usually it's not best to call them on the carpet because it's not as productive as going to them separately. But yeah, there are times where when you need to amplify somebody's point and, and actually give them attribution so that people know, oh, okay, wait a minute, that, that, that went on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've had, the, I've had uh, taking it back channels blow up on me as well, though. Right, that, that same person that gave you that hard time that day uh, did that to me when I tried to have a conversation with her about how something had gone off the rails in a, and she felt singled out. So it's, it's, a, it's a fine line, I think. Um, in general, I, you, know, you don't wanna be that person who's forever nailing every single person, like, you're doing it now and now you're doing it over here and all that, but at the same time, as an ally, I think we have a unique position if we hear it happening, if we see the person caving in the corner because they're feeling it, to step in between and say, by the way, I see what you're doing to this person here, whether you realize it or not, right? I think that, and I liked your style on the whole, let me restate that and point out that she said it first, mm -hmm. you know, right? That's, that's a great trick. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, we have a question here about asking you to share an instance of being in LA, a specific instance, Guy, when you got to, mm. when you got to do that. Uh, well, okay, I have a couple, but I think one of them you saw in the, in the second video clip. So I, was mod I got to moderate a panel at an Autodesk internal event that was all about showcasing um, women engineers and actually one, one trans engineer and, and basically highlighting what they had to say because they were never given you know, direct access to show everybody else in the company sort of the, the perspective they had and the, and the value that they had. And I loved being able to do that. I got that on the, on the, uh, on the uh, conference program and was able to moderate it and uh, fantastic. Love doing that. Cool, thank you. Um, okay, here's somebody talking about weed out challenges. And I would like to say something about this whole topic of weeding out, um, but this is a person who's got some empathy for the weeders. so. Let me say that the, there's no weeding out like law school weeding out, right? There's a whole, whole year of hazing to, to force the 
people that aren't up to the job out, even though they're not actually learning about their job, they're just learning about their profession and the extent to which everybody's on everybody else's throats. And I'm not convinced that it's making lo the law a better place to work or live, right? Um, that hyper competitiveness thing. So we've gotten past the point of trying to figure out what the law is to some other thing um, where we make movies about it and we, you know, it's, it's, it's gotten pretty sick. But back in the day, I think it was an attempt to find the best single contributor as opposed to collaborative contributor. And I think that we may have seen a sea, sea change um, thanks to open source and some other things where we're starting to realize that those individual contributors, it's kind of like the genius asshole myth, but applied to a whole profession. Like we, we, we maybe need to reward collaboration instead of, instead of winnowing out. I mean, we do this in data, instead of being reductionist, we're trying to look at all the data now and come up with a synergistic model that works more like the way the human brain works, right? So why can't we do that in hiring? Now, this person is saying, um, I feel like weed out challenges and strict job requirements come from a place of almost desperation to find some way of narrowing down sometimes hundreds of applicants, especially for junior entry level positions. Is there a right way to do that candidate search? And how does one, self, how does one sell removing weed out to a team when it sounds like a huge resource cost? All right, well, um, one, I would say that it's very, I would not say that it is the norm for um, companies to get hundreds and hundreds of applicants. Um, there are certain companies, I'm sure they get tons of them. You know, if you're Google or AWS or IBM, maybe you get hundreds and hundreds of, you know, people trying to apply straight out of school. What I see from um, our sponsors, our sponsor companies, I see, you know, a laundry, they, they usually have the list of careers that they have open and available are a mile long and they can't get anyone to apply. Um, so, you know, I think that maybe that whole weeding out idea is a little different if you're in a, um, in a particular company where you are actually getting hundreds and hundreds of junior applicants, okay? My answer to that would be perhaps your company needs to initiate some kind of internship program or path that is more specifically geared towards your entry level and junior positions so that you can, you can be a little bit more open with the process than constantly you know, declining or pushing out, okay? Um, yep. Be a little bit more creative about how you're bringing in new people um, rather than just kind of, you know, scaring people away <laughs> and having them run for the I, I still think that's the secret design of, of Summer of Code, actually. At the time that Summer of Code came out, mm -hmm. Google was going to every conference to hire, like straight up recruiters in every booth, you know, taking your name and seeing if you wanted to have a conversation. And, and Summer of Code is almost like a, like a mini internship. It's like a remote internship, right? Mm -hmm. Where they could see how people adapt to working in the way that Google was working. I thought it was a pretty clever hack because they, they simultaneously got all kinds of props for being good open source citizens, right? So, okay, here's one. Um, I understood that the purpose of code challenges and whiteboard challenges are to see how a candidate goes through the process of problem solving. What might be a more comfortable or respectful alternative? Okay, whiteboard challenges. Whiteboard challenges, yes, I understand. You want to see how this person thinks, okay? But not every personality type is really encouraged by that kind of environment, okay? Uh, I, for example, am, believe it or not, even though I'm sitting here speaking, I'm quite the introvert, okay? And um, when I have a tendency to start trying to think through a problem, I get very like focused and I tend to drown everything out and I kind of focus in on the problem and I, and I go through a lot of thought process in that. Um, doesn't really work well with whiteboarding. However, a lot of those same companies that rely heavily on whiteboarding would probably really appreciate my skill set because I'm highly skilled at a lot of things, okay? 
Um, I think that there's this tendency in, in hiring, okay, to apply what works for you to other people, to think that, well, I'm looking for somebody who's good at what I do and mm -hmm. or relates to things the way that I do in order to, for them to be proficient, okay? And I think that if you're gonna have a team where there's a lot of different types of thinkers, a lot of different types of people that interact with things in very different ways, you're gonna need people who are different than you. So if you're really comfortable on a whiteboard, great, bully for you, but you're passing up a lot of talent that just really frankly isn't that's gonna sit there and go, okay, normally I would have, uh, first of all, I wouldn't be incredibly nervous. Uh, two, I wouldn't be sitting there thinking, oh my gosh, what happens if I don't get this job, right? <laughs> I've got kids to feed and a mortgage, right? The, the, the process of getting a job is very stressful for a lot of people. And so when you put them even more in a stressful situation than expect them to think uh, in the way that you would think through it is it's not really super fun or welcoming, okay? Great. Okay, we have a question. Can we further discuss the challenge of being an ally for a group of which you are not a part? There's a big risk of seeming insincere or out of touch or not trustworthy. Is there a best practice for avoiding giving the wrong impression? So Denise Let's, already probably yeah. knows how I'm gonna answer this question, which is it doesn't start there. It starts with how you, how you are and what kind of a person you are. And you have to earn that, you have, quite honestly, you have to earn that right to, to, to be an advocate. And so, you know, when I said in the video, I sat in that meeting and I didn't say anything. I mean, honestly, I wasn't going to say anything. And then I was asked a direct question and say, say, please address this because I was there to show my support. I was there to listen, uh, to figure out sort of what I could do. Uh, and I think that's a really, really important thing is just to, is just to be there, to be present, to listen. And, and, and honestly, to, to be consistent in how you sort of approach this from a humility standpoint. Um, Denise knows this from knowing me for a long time that, that I, I am who I am, both kind of in the community and outside of the community. And I think it's really important to make sure you have that consistency. Yeah, I usually find actually it's, it's easier to advocate for a group that you're not a part of because it seems less, it comes across a lot of the time as less self-serving. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I, as a black female, if I'm in an environment where I feel like someone who is um, LGBTQ is getting not what they, <laughs> with, the, with the, the treatment that they shouldn't be, being able to step in and say, mm, you know, what we're doing here, that's not working. You know, um, it's easier, I find it easier to kind of celebrate the successes of or highlight the uh, attributes of people who are also marginalized, but not marginalized in the same way that I am, uh, if that makes sense. So, you know, or, or not, uh, I'm not in that position at that time. Uh, new mothers, I remember uh, we had an issue with like new moms coming back to the office and there was like no lactation room and no support for, you know, a lot of the things that they needed coming back. And I could understand their position. I wasn't in that position at the time. So I felt like it was easier for me to be able to advocate for that and kind of like go to bat, like, uh, -uh no, this is, this is not how we're going to do things. Um, so I think, I think you can see it as a plus. You can see it as a plus as well. Yeah, I would like to share an ally story that's a really simple one that anybody can do, which is um, noticing people who are sitting by themselves and looking out of, out of place, and especially around a conference table, go sit next to them, you know, and, and, and include them, even just with your physical presence, because uh, it's really hard being, feeling different in a room and um, it's a great thing to feel like there's somebody there with you, especially if you're scared, right? That's a good thing. Um, about weeding out, mm -hmm. my best hiring endeavors, and I've done a lot of hiring, right? Um, are where my top three candidates all make it into the company eventually. And I have to say, you know, I can't hire you right now, but I really want to. So I'm gonna stay in touch with you. 
and, and, you know, they've only given me this much money to, and I only have room for one, but I'm going to get more in next quarter. And I really want to call you. Those have been really successful for me. Um, there is a person here still worried about what to do about the weeding out and specifically justifying, uh, reducing that a little bit in their hiring practice. Um, and I think that this is a real problem because we're simultaneously told we have to have diverse hiring panels and diverse candidate panels to tick some box about we, we didn't only just hire the person that looked like us, except that it always ends up that way anyway. You know, so maybe there's a way to do it that's more like the orchestra thing where, where it's a blind, at least up to a certain point, you, they don't know what you look like or who you are, they just see your talent. Um, at Wikipedia, we used to, and this is not something everybody can do, but we used to give challenges that we were actually facing, real world problems that we needed to solve out as sort of homework. And then we'd look at, that's how we figured out how people think was looking at the work that they went through. We'd like to see your notes, um, but you can use the internet. You can use anything you'd be using in a normal day. And what we're looking for is your problem solving too. So tell them that up front. And um, some people hated it and felt like they were being asked to do free work, but it was Wikipedia. So it's kind of implicitly like that anyway. Um, that was a really good way to ferret out who was more creative without thinking too much about what they look like. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, let's see. Um, what are some ways of setting an example to help other people become better allies? I think the question was besides setting an example. And, and I actually like that question because it, it, it goes to something that I've always thought about this, which is that reaching out and having a conversation with somebody, especially, you know, male, uh, male in tech to another male in tech to say, hey, you have something to offer and kind of working with them individually to say, hey, I think you'd be a great mentor for this group, or I think you have something to offer in this context uh, is to me much better than just saying, okay, hey, let's follow, you know, great male allies, whoever they are, let's follow their example. But actually having that conversation and making it a personal connection is really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's great advice. Do you have something, Susan? You know, we, we have a lot of, of male allies in Women in Tech Allies. And um, I think that a lot of the time there are people, there are people that are interested in being allies, but they're not sure exactly what to do. Like, okay, great. I want to be an ally. Now what, you know, <laughs> right. Um, I think that if even just presenting them with opportunities to be an ally or to get involved can really help. Um, and some of the things that we've done is just having networking events, honestly, being the type of person who, you know, Everyone has worked somewhere where the HR person has come out and said, hey, we, we have a couple of new positions coming open. Do you know anybody? Right. And what ends up happening is you end up recommending the people that you know. And if all the people that you know look or come from the exact same background that you have, then, you know, we're going to remain homogenous. Right. Um, so just getting the opportunity to network with people who maybe come from a different background than you do. Um, that right there is great. Uh, we also have opportunities where we have mentorship programs that we try to set, set up and hook people up with mentors. We have opportunities for them to come and teach on a topic that maybe there's so few people, uh, so few diverse people who even are working in that particular area in our area that we can't even find anyone to talk about it. And they'll come and say, right. you know what? Uh, I may, you know, not fit the bill for being diverse, but I would love to teach some more so that there next time there is somebody, right? Or to spark an interest in that direction. Um, you know, offering the opportunity for people to um, run an internship program or, you know, there, there's a lot of different places where if they knew how to get involved, they probably would. Yeah. I, I have one more that it's not, you can't always arrange to do it, but if you can, it's really interesting. Try working in a company where um, the, the normal privileged culture is not in the majority and see what that feels like. You'll learn a lot about how, what's needed, right? 
-hmm. just putting yourself in that situation for a little while, which I did inadvertently at PayPal, but they're 65% Southeast Asian. And so all of these systems we're talking about were biased in the direction of more people that look like them. And it was fascinating. It was very interesting. Mm -hmm. so. Can I say one more thing about weeding out? Because we did get a couple of questions there. And I think it's just a general answer to some of that. Yeah, of course. When I say weeding out, to f I don't want you to necessarily focus on specific practices. Like we can't give code challenges now because it's a weeding out practice. Um, or we can't have good job descriptions because it's a weeding out process. It's more of a thought shift than it is purely a practice, okay? If the purpose of your code challenge and your process around it is specifically designed to try to bring out the potential in the person that is applying, that is different than to weed out the person that is applying. If your job description is created specifically to prevent people and put a wall up versus trying to draw out the interest and eagerness or excitement about a particular technology or whatever from a person, then that's the shift that I'm asking you to make. It's more mental than anything else. And the process follows. Is that, I don't know if that makes some more yeah, sense. That totally makes sense. I remember how revolutionary Google's job postings felt when they first started doing them because it sounded like it was going to be fun, you know? Right. Gets you excited. So, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I can Susan, see that. I can totally see that. Yeah, Susan, to your, one of your points about kind of the what it's like when you're sitting there and you're being asked to do it right there. Uh, I actually at one point interviewed for a job at Indeed and they had a great way of looking at this, which was that they gave you the code project to work on before you came to the interview. And so you had a chance to sit there and kind of work through it. And they were very intentional about not it not being a weeding out, but wanting you to write the code, we had some of it written, and then wanting you to come and explain what your thought processes were, how you got there, which I liked because it was less about, oh, we're trying to weed you out on the spot by making you do this like, okay, you know, God, can I remember my data specters algorithm class, right? But it's more, oh, I have the chance to look at it and, and sort of work through it. I thought that was a really good approach. That's excellent. That's exactly right. Yeah, that does sound great.